important to have like a brush pile. Back part of your yard, again, have this brush pile. Um, it, it's used as shelter. Even butterflies will use it as shelter. But sometimes, well, it's not very sightly. I don't want that in my yard. Plant a vine over top of it. Now you, again, you, um, you know, two things at once have been covered with that. So there's always options on how you can spruce or make things a little bit prettier that are there. Oh, we're talking about spice bushes. One of my very, very favorite there things. And um, years ago, I went to um, Callaway, you know, uh, they do the, not Callaway, but up in uh, Western North Carolina, they do the native plant conference every year. Ooh, isn't that awesome to go to? Oh my gosh. But um, one year I went on one where they were doing cooking. She made a pound cake out of the little uh, spice bush berries that were there that was really good as pet free, but interesting. Now, the reason not all of these are native, though, are they? But one of the easiest ways to get black swallowtails to get, come to your yard, parsley and fennel. Years ago, I'm teaching a workshop, and I, this woman did not realize that the little, what she called worms on her parsley were black swallowtails. She said, I kept pulling them off and killing them because they were eating my parsley. And uh, she was mortified because, of course, she loved butterflies. That's why she was at the class. And I said, my dear, just plant extras, some for you and some for them. That's all you have to do. But of course, they will devour it, don't they? Down to the stalk, down to the stalk. And those are two of the easiest, I think, to grow and entice to your yard is probably black swallowtail. And remember, that's the one that I said, hold in your hand and take a little sniff of the little yellow things when they come out. Oh, and the sunflower, I was so mad at my sister one year. She stopped by visiting, she's weeding, not realizing everything she's pulling up is not a weed. It was my sunflower that was there, my swamp sunflower that she had pulled every single one up. Now, certain parts of year though, some things might not be blooming, so you might, might want to have another choice. Now, so as you can see from the list that I have here, butterflies eat other things as well. You see dungs on there. Um, you, anytime you have that rotten piece of fruit, don't throw it away, don't compost it. You can sit there, you can mash it up, put it in a little dish and put it outside. Sometimes I just put it on my back deck. If you put it in your garden, don't put it way in the middle of the garden because the butterflies won't be able to get there, but don't put it so far like just out in the open because they need to feel that safety around them. So just the front part of it and they will come and they, I've, I've used bananas that, you know, where the peels are just so black you can't, you know, there's not, you can't even make banana bread anymore. Old watermelons, old cantaloupes, they absolutely love many of these things that are there. And then sometimes I do tell people, I said, you know when you're gardening, okay, you have permission to go to the bathroom in your yard. No, just to go pee in your yard, I'm sorry. <laughs> and I was watching a show one time and they had landed their boat, this group of scientists on this beach. And um, everybody had went to the restroom on the beach and then went off and, you know, to do what they had to do in the jungle. And they came back and there were butterflies everywhere. And I went, oh my goodness, look at this. We now have permission. Just don't let your neighbors see you, right? And then um, the other thing I tell people, you know what, when you sweat, have you ever had butterflies land on you? So it's okay, bring that sweat up because it's the minerals that they're being attracted to. The same with the urine, the dunk, it's all the minerals. So there's also, there's a little concoction that you can make. You can take one overripe banana, like I talked about, very, very black skin, one overripe banana, one cup of honey, one cup of brown sugar, and a can of beer. What you're gonna do is you mix this all up, let it set out overnight, Tell your husband what you've done because I had one woman come in and say her husband decided that he felt that was dessert. <laughs> and, um, and then what you can do, you have two choices. You can paint trees with it and the butterflies will come up and start to eat on it. Or you can also put it out on trays as well. So what you've done here, it's all the minerals. That the, what's in the beer are actually some of the different minerals that butterflies will be attracted to. So you're able to, um, to use that. If you don't want to add the beer part to it, you don't have to do that either. Oh, it's one overripe banana, one cup of honey, one cup of brown sugar, and then one cup and one can of beer. And mash it all up and let it set overnight. It needs to ferment. That's what I've noticed. Many times when I do raise the butterflies with, um, you know, one thing, you can, you can keep them a bit longer and feed them. 
Um, but I've noticed they really enjoy the fruit when it's been sitting out a couple of days. You can also take one of those little scrunchy, uh, you know, the nylon scrubbers. Use one of those in a dish. You can pour juicy juice in there. It's 100% juice is the reason. And, um, but when it ferments and it sits out several days, they love it. They love it. So it's all about the, the fermentation. You get little drunk butterflies. <laughs> but you, you will have other things that will be attracted to your, um, to your milkweed. It's a whole little, you know, habitat unto itself. Sometimes I've had calls from people saying, what in the world is that little fuzzy thing? Well, it's a tussock moth. They also use a, a, a milkweed as their host plant. This is the bad news that happens. The number of aphids that also are drawn to this plant. And you know, they're sucking all the juices out. A, any, any host plant, the, a mother will not lay her eggs on there if it is not a healthy plant. When she puts her feet down, she is tasting. If it is not a healthy plant, she's gonna go somewhere else. And um, so make sure with those, I usually just pick them off and squish them, pick them off and squish them. Um, please don't spray, you know, so pick them off and squish them or use a water hose to get them off. But definitely get them off because the, number, the, the amount of juices that they suck off. What I also have done in the years past, because sometimes we don't have enough milkweed, at the end of the season, if you still have good healthy milkweed, freeze it like you would um, up your herbs. Put it on, you know, put it between paper towels, pop it in the freezer. Then the next year, if you have monarchs and don't have enough milkweed, you can give them a leaf of that. You know, don't take the whole bag out because they will crumble like herbs do, you know, when it dries. So just give them, so get, you can just give them, he's all boy. You can just give them um, just one, one or two pieces at a time. And, and especially if you're going to work with schools or something to do this, it's always a good thing to do as well. And um, if you do decide that you do want to grow this, this is not one you just dig up out of the ground. Look at the root on that plant. This is not, yeah, you see, you don't come because you end up, um, you know, cutting. There's no way to really get this out whole unless it's the, right at the very, very beginning of spring when the root hasn't grown yet. It easily propagates. It's a very easy propagate, uh, plant to propagate there. One thing I do to capture my um, seeds from my seed pod, I love to use old pantyhose. Or you can go how, you know, they have those little nylon mesh bags for weddings. They're like little wedding gift bags. I think Michael's, I've seen them there and stuff. And it has a drawstring. You can use one of those as well. Or like I said, old pantyhose. I just put it on the end of my seed pod or any seed pod that I have. I kind of tie it on there. And that way when it explodes, I get all the seeds in my little packet there and don't have to worry about it. So just a little hint there. But there's a plant that looks just like it. And people get excited and they're like, oh, look, I've got, a, you know, I've got, I've got milkweed. But no, it's dog vein. And it does look very similar, except you're going to see that the, the stem of this is more reddish and it does have, um, has little hairs on it. So don't get confused. These are just some of the species we have here in Georgia. You can see they're all different. The leaves are different. The flowers are different. And they do grow, look at that one with the barrens, how the leaves are, are um, much slimmer and pointier as the poke milkweed. That is not what you make poke salad out of, by the way. And um, swamp milkweed, the name is very confusing. You don't need a swamp to grow it, and it's actually probably one of the best ones, the one that I would recommend for you to grow. It's very easy, and it spreads very nicely. Now, another reason with your um, host plants that you also want to have clustered, because what a caterpillar will do as a defense, if, you, if um, something comes up, it will curl into a ball and it will drop to the ground. They only have simple eyes at this stage, which is basically light sensors. Hey, daylight, time for me to eat. Or nighttime, it's time. Actually, that most of them will eat at night. And very few will eat actually in the daytime because of, of predators being there. But, um, so they curl, they fall to the ground. And then with those simple eyes, if there's just a plant, they're going to end up many times crawling in the wrong direction because they can't see the plant. But if you have a cluster, they're going to be able to easily get back on that plant. And so that's a, always a good thing to do as well. And um, the last part is having the water source. <coughs> Bird baths don't work with butterflies. What they do many times, if you've ever been near a creek or a stream, you'll see a lot of times butterflies are congregating there in the mud or in the sand. And so what they're doing is they're, that's the way that they get their, their moisture. So you can create different things. So 
Uh, if you wanted to scoop out a place in the ground and line it with plastic, you can just get play sand at one of the um, you know, home improvement places. Mix in about, for every 10 pounds of sand, put in about a cup of salt. And the reason for that is the minerals that they need. And then keep it lightly damp. And that would be their water source for them. So if you wanted to get a little fancier and actually have containers here, you're welcome to do that. Or you can just within your garden itself, like I said, just create a little, uh, you know, a little depression there that you put some sand in and keep moist for them. And then probably the easiest thing is add a rock. Like I said, they have to fly before they can really fly to do their nectaring. Has to be about 80 degrees. Their body has to be about 80 degrees. And so by adding that rock, it's a basking place for them where they can sit and they can warm up those wings so they can begin the nectary um, process. So that's an easy thing to add. Of course, in the winter, we have some species, if they lay their eggs later in the season, the egg might actually overwinter. Some, if they're still in the caterpillar stage, may overwinter in that stage as well. Um, monarchs are not the only ones that migrate. Viceroys will um, also, or frillaries, excuse me, will also migrate. And so I tell people, be very careful if you have firewood piles because this makes an excellent, excellent place for them to overwinter. And then you're pulling them in, or you're having a bonfire, and all of these wonderful things that you've attracted to your yard, you just burned up. So when you bring the wood in, just look, especially underneath the bark, to see that, um, make sure no, nothing's under there. This year, monarch numbers are lower than they have ever been. It is critical, and this was the thing years ago, I had a chance to go to Mexico to see, there's only 14 places they migrate to in Mexico. And when I went with a, I went with a biologist, he said this might be a phenomenon that may be only another 10 years. And this year, like I said, with the numbers. But there's several things that are happening between Canada, the United States, and Mexico. One being, they do not have enough host plant. People hear the word milkweed, they don't want to plant it. And so that's critical that that gets planted. Habitat destruction and degradation has been another one that has greatly harmed uh, monarchs. Another thing that has greatly harmed them has been, um, especially in the Midwest, where they do plant a lot of corn. It's the species of corn that they are planting um, is actually uh, harming the, the monarchs as well because they're, these GMO, uh, the modified corn that they're doing, has the, the chemicals that they're using in there as well. And of course in Mexico, when they cut these forests down, there's, like I said, only 14. You can't even clear, you can't even do selective cutting because they need, it's a microclimate, they need the clusters of those trees to stay warm and be able to survive in the winter. But this part of Mexico, we no longer are, this year our trip got canceled because um, there's a lot of unrest there. Um, like decapitations and I mean there, it's it's bad you know I know that is, that is a lot of unrest but you don't hear about these things on the news of what's going on in this particular area the third person in charge in Mexico was actually also killed and and so you know we cannot we cannot in good conscience you know take people on a trip down to Mexico with all of this happening but that was part of what was funding it was ecotourism and so it was a way these people have no other income this is this is not in tourist area at all you are miles and miles and miles away and um so there you know that's why they would cut the wood it's a way for them to live they could sail they would burn firewood to cook their food and without tourists coming into this area that's probably you know your alternative is you know for them is probably the other option is to go back and start cutting trees i am um I'm going to leave you with not, I'm, I'm not going to say not to use pesticides because I think there's a time and a place, but don't ever, ever, ever spray the flowers. I used to work at a nature center. We had an observation beehive. Within, what happened was somebody sprayed because they complied within a two mile radius. They brought that poison back and completely that hive wiped out in overnight. And the same thing, when you're spraying those flowers, those insects, are landing on that flower and of course they're also because poisons are indiscriminate and so anything that's there um, is going to also be poisoned now one thing too if you think about this um, with the poisons that you they don't always kill everything and so sometimes it's okay to have a, a couple of chew holes on that particular plant that is there try to see if nature will take its course first 
and see if they can kind of balance itself out, you know, things like ladybugs, praying mantis, that sort of thing, instead of just seeing like the first chew bite and thinking, oh, I need to get in there and spray real fast and all this. And if you do have to spray, don't do it in the morning because that's when most pollinators are visiting their flowers or, or in the morning. And then late afternoon um, is more rest time for them. And then, guess what? All of that I just did. All of that was just you thinking about what you needed to do. Now, don't do as I do. Do as I say. Sketch out your plan of what you need. That way, three years from now, you're not having to go back and rearrange everything. And so... Um, that's always the way I know, I know, you know, probably, I don't know, how many of you are like me, though? You kind of just, yeah. okay, nobody's going to admit it, then. that's okay. <laughs> and lastly, if you do have monarchs, you can tell the difference. Boys have a little black dot on their hind wings. That's a pheromone pouch that is there. Girls do not. And then the other one that I have is up there, top, um, top left, that's a viceroy. It mimics a monarch, and people would say, oh, yes, because it's trying to mimic a monarch because monarchs don't taste good. Because, you know, when they eat milkweed, they sequester, they take in the poisons from the milkweed plant. Scientists have done studies. They cut the wings off the viceroy. They cut the wings off of a monarch, and they fed it to a blue jay. It caused both, caused it to throw up. So it is also poisonous, but it's a different type of mimicry they have found. I know, yeah, don't eat it. That's my, that, that should be my, the moral of the story today. Don't eat the butterfly. <laughs> and um, lastly, if you don't have the space, you can even, if you live in an apartment, I tell people, you can garden. You can put an entire butterfly garden just in a container. That includes a puddling. That includes nectar sources and hose plants and a little rock for basking. You can do all of that. And um, lastly, enjoy that garden. Like I said, you did all of that hard work, and you can get it certified through Monarchs Across Georgia. We actually have a new sign now. Um, I have to switch that one out. National Wildlife also has a program. I mean, show it off, all the hard work that you've done, and uh, make a point to go out there with your binoculars and see them. Does anybody have any questions on this? That was, I told you, this is a 10-hour workshop, and I'm like r rushing through. But it is so much fun for you to bring, you know, one of those caterpillars in. I don't care what species it is. And watch, just match. To me, it's magic. It's like nature magic there. And it, it's so enjoyable. So if you do get a chance, did she do that too? Yes. Oh, she has a question. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Can you get one? With some of those, yes, you can, but some are extremely rare. In your packet that y'all got on the back, on the last page where there's resources, there's, the group is Monarchs Across Georgia. Even if you go to that website, you will see all the other milkweeds we have here in Georgia, and there's also a list of places where you can get things, um, some of the different plants. Unfortunately, some of the seeds, we're still working with some of the, um, especially North Georgia, a lot of the Master Gardener groups up there collecting seeds, and they're trying to, to grow and start to get more of those out because how rare some of them are and uh, also how much they're needed here in, in um, our state as well. Please plant milkweed, please plant, I'm glad you do. It is worth sharing, it, it is, yes ma'am. It is actually, it's not a, no, the Luna Moth, now the Luna Moth itself, no, it is a, um, uh, sweet gum is one for it. Now, you know, Luna Moths do not eat as an adult. They only live for three days after they become an adult, and their whole job is to find a boyfriend or a girlfriend, and that's it. That's what, you know, that's my answer for the kids, is to do that. Yes, ma'am. I have heard somewhere through the years that, um, uh, I'm glad you brought that up because some of them they are grown they're grown to be showy mm -hmm. and I'm going to tell you something else when you buy plants you want that big showy flower but not for butterflies and the reason because they have they contain very little nectar those double triple blooms that you buy 
no nectar in them. I completely forgot to mention that, so I'm glad you said that. That is true. So that's why, again, you want to go back to your old piney plants. You want to go back to your native plants, if this is something that you're very interested in. A lot of our old tiny stuff, maybe it doesn't look as pretty, but you know what? The wildlife enjoy it so much more. But as, as our human eyes, we think those flowers, ooh, look at that triple bloom on that, you know? Mm -mm, not gonna bring the butterflies though. Anybody else have a question for me? I think it's lunch time, but I'll take, okay, you have a question for me? Are you good? You're all good? They will, and you know what, I'm glad you said, because like, the, you know I love, I love late petunias, because you know those things just grow and grow. No nectar in those, but the old tiny ones will. But the new, yes, yes. So I stopped buying the wave ones, because after I found out they didn't have the nectar source that was in there. Yes, ma'am. No mulching, she said, if you're going to plant the old fashioned ones. No mulching. Okay, guys. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. Thank you again. You have, oh. you have my email. And you are welcome to email me if you would like. And again, I do apologize for messing everything up today. But please, please make sure you're doing pollinator gardens. Today, when you eat lunch, I want you, every three, four, three out of four bites you put in your mouth, I want you to think a pollinator. Because that, how different our diet would be without their services. Thank you.